in the pasture and I'll go, you know, one of the horses' name is Tater. It's like, Tater, where's Jack? Which is his buddy. And then I will drive around and park by the corral. And here they come. So this is a part of 30 acres. And so I'm fortunate enough to be able to uh, have my horse here. We had a really wet summer and fall. I left the islands for six weeks because it was so wet. But I had put out the word to the farrier that if anybody wanted to get rid of their horses, please let me know. So Jack had a partner named Sammy. And Sammy was probably 26 when I acquired him. So the Dixons went and looked at the horses because I was still in the mainland. And they said, yeah, they'll work. So Keith and his dad took them to Keith's dad's in Kula and we doctored their hooves. And then right after I returned, probably about three weeks later, we brought them here. And so uh, Sammy passed away two years ago. So he is buried right here. So now I don't know where the boys are. They were here. <laughs> I'll have to go see if we can't find them. We may have gone to get water. So. Here. And we'll see if we can't find him. Yeah, Tater. Like a bird on a tree. I'm just sitting here. I got time, it's clear to see From up here, the world seems small We can sit together, it's so beautiful You and me, we meant to be I am a caregiver by nature, I'm a person that enjoys being in nature. And out of that love of nature, I've discovered riding horses, being outside, 
incorporating that in my everyday life that I try to share with other people. My name is Shirley Rainey. I am from Northern California, born and raised in Sacramento. Uh, my grandfather had a turkey ranch next to McClellan Air Force Base where the Tuskegee Airmen used to come and hang out on the weekends. Maui has become home for me. I have traveled um, internationally and have lived in different parts of the West. and. I found by visiting the islands, specifically Maui, it kept calling me back. And as I kind of wonder, well, maybe there's someplace else I would like to be, the voice within me says Maui is home. And I like the energy. I truly embrace the diversity and the pono that is shared. It, it resonates with me. I can remember taking my dad's belt and using hangers to make stirrups and putting it over the side chair in our home. And I would say that memory is maybe three years old, four years old. And my grandparents lived in Rio Linda, California, which um, where McClellan Air Force Base is and there was a place where we could go ride horses and that was all I wanted to do from a very young age is to ride horses. So I was able to in a period of my life where it's like okay what do I want to do? I grew dreadlocks and bought a couple of horses, built a barn and actually became a true cowgirl. And it's all of it. It is figuring out when they have colic. It's the assessment. And I think that comes from my nursing background to be able to say, okay, we need to worm you. We need to groom you. We need to take care of you because you're a little sore. And for me, it's grounding. When you are on a horse, there has to be an energetic connection because they will sense it. And if you're fearful, they will sense that. But when there is that connection, you are one with the horse. It is the most exhilarating experience that you can have. So I've ridden horses and own horses in Southern California. I was a wrangler in Moab, Utah. And when I came to Maui, that came with me too, the love of horses. And so I feel a lot of gratitude that I'm still able to participate in a passion that is truly dear to my heart. My current relationship with horses is to actually feel grounded. It's to be able to walk into a pasture and have the horse come to me and to actually follow me around because then we're actually engaged and we're in sync. It's not just about getting on the horse and riding him or her, but it's also having the ability to communicate with the horse. And when you are training your horse, maybe he doesn't get it right away and maybe he will only give you a half step, but when he gives you that half step, you tell him, good boy, and you reward him, and you stop right then and there because he's given something to you. And you honor that and you respect that. It's not about cowboying up. It's about the relationship, and that's what's really important to me. I learned how to ride horses at a very young age. 
going back to my grandfather's turkey ranch in Rolinda. I would say it was probably my sixth birthday. My dad bought me the whole cowgirl outfit and I was the lead. I was the scout on this little pony. And we're trotting along and Pony comes to the creek and Pony says, no. So I went over head first. Creek wasn't very deep. Got wet, was embarrassed. All the aunties and uncles, everybody's laughing. But it never deterred me. It was just something in me that was so important. So I continued on that quest. And then whenever I'd go on vacation, I would ride horses. But then it really became a part of me later in life, where it was to have that connection with the horses because they all have personalities and they all interact in their, and they are herd animals. And so you become the alpha or the lead horse. And that's the connection that you want. So for me, it wasn't just learning about riding. It was learning about the connection that you have with horses and a gentle approach. I've been kicked. Um, I've been bucked off. Um, I've been on a horse when he has startled. But that's all of it. You learn how to stay centered and balanced in that just like in life, there are accidents, there are things that happen, but it only created a deeper love for horses. And at 65, I'm still riding. horseback riding whenever the opportunity presents itself and for example yesterday I went and saw my horses at the pasture and I just cleaned their hooves I talked to them um, fed them so whenever the opportunity presents itself and it could be riding I have friends that I ride with in Kula but it also could be just going to the pasture and being with the horses for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And it's also talking to them. That really warms my heart and they will hear me and they will nicker and they will come to me. And it doesn't mean that, oh good, I've caught you. Now I'm gonna put a saddle on you and now we're gonna ride. It's just that gift of being able to be with the horse. It's very grounding for me. A rodeo is an experience where there's a group of people that come together and they love horses. And I have been involved in the rodeo here on Maui for the past five years. This is the first experience that I've had up close and personal, except when I have gone to the national finals in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, and I have never felt more pride than actually sitting in the stands and watching this performance with the finest bronc riders, the finest barrel racers, it is just warms your heart. As I'm sharing this with you right now, I'm getting goose pimples just remembering that experience. I enjoy horseback riding wherever I can ride. Um, I've ridden through the national parks in Moab, Utah. I have ridden at night on a horse. And what you have to do is you have to completely trust because they 
have better vision and they hear better. So that's when you allow yourself to just be free and let him take care of you. I have ridden in the crater. I have ridden at the beach. I have ridden on the roads. It's just to ride. It's the connection. What does it take to be a cowgirl? It takes love. It takes gratitude. It takes courage. It takes you to a place where there's harmony and there is a connection with you and your horse. For me, there's no better relationship than when you're able to get on your horse, you take a breath, you do a few stretching exercises with him, kind of like yoga, and then you go, okay, let's go and see what we can discover together. How do I feel when I'm horseback riding? I feel grounded, but I also have to take a moment as soon as I get on my horse to take a breath and to be present so that we are able to have that connection. I find that when I rush or it's, I've only got, oh, I've only got 45 minutes to ride, then that's when accidents will happen. But if you allow your, yourself the time to take a breath, to breathe, to connect with the horse, then he knows that he is safe. And that's what's important, that he may not have the confidence, but you do. And that's, that's what's important. advice would I give to a woman or a girl who is learning to horseback ride? The advice I would give them is to start with groundwork, to remove the fear, because they are very powerful animals and if you allow the fear to take over, the horse will sense that. At the same time, don't become overconfident because you've had many years of experience. Horses will keep you humble. I have been kicked, I have been bucked, and I have been thrown. But what it does, it allows me to be present every time I walk up to my horse because it has to be about mutual respect and love and, and gratitude and to remember to stay humble. Having courage when you're learning something new is an opportunity to continue to grow. If you don't have courage, you don't grow. And it's important to grow emotionally, spiritually, and physically. of the day. What have I learned today? And in the morning, what will I learn? And that removes all the fear. And that way, I'm able to go through my day with an open heart. And that's very important. That's my motivation, to have an open heart of love and not let fear run my life. My role model is my auntie who has passed away. Her name uh, was Vonnie Sweeney. She was involved in the music industry for many, 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 many years. And what was so wonderful about her is that she had unconditional love for everyone, no matter what time it was. And it wasn't about monetary values. It was just about who she was and the gift 
And whenever I would call, she's like, hey, baby girl, what are you doing? And so she is in my heart. Where are some of my favorite places to visit in the world? I would say the most magical place for me is when I went to Ireland and was able to actually ride horses on the beach and just the energy of, of Ireland, the castles, the scenery and the people are very loving. And to this day, I have a very good friend who lives in Dublin and whenever he surfaces here in the States, I get the phone call. And we have these beautiful conversations. And I would say Ireland was, was very magical for me to ride horses. The joys of friendship is when you haven't heard from someone in a long time, and then the conversation is picked up right from where you left it. And that's what's very wonderful about friendship. And that it needs to be unconditional. It needs to have integrity. And you need to be able to share things, whether it makes that other person feel uncomfortable or if you feel uncomfortable. To me, that's, that's a true friend. The gems of nature, for me, is actually even being outside barefoot for a minute, two minutes. There's not just one gem, it's nature and it what it's about what it represents and that we call it mother nature. And so there's a lot of respect and love that I have for nature. I decided to become a nurse because I have a desire to show compassion and to help, but not at the expense of myself. That's the one thing that I've learned by being a nurse. I have the opportunity to recognize the importance of helping individuals, but also to be honest with what's going on with them and not to sugarcoat it so that you can help them to the best of their abilities to take care of themselves. The most important part to take care of is all. It's not just one part. We are an integrative system and so it's on all levels. It's physical, it's emotional, it's spiritual, it's well-being. And we need to remember that we are a unit and to address all aspects of self. What is eye care? Eye care came out of watching and being involved in the healthcare industry and being involved with hospice on a personal level but also volunteering and as a nurse. So I care stands for I create a restorative experience and it's truly geared towards initially um, the caregivers who are taking care of a loved one that has a chronic condition or is going to transition. What I discovered is that that care partner, that caregiver is so focused on that loved one that when they transition, that there is a void and they don't know what to do because they've not taken care of themselves. So there has to be equanimity, there has to be a balance, and you have to share that with the care partner. And you can ask them what they're doing for themselves. They have a sense of community, they're still seeing their friends, they're still going um, 
to the gym. They're still cooking. They're remembering to take care of themselves because if they don't do that, then they have compromised their well-being and possibly will not be able to take care of that loved one. So it's grown from that to sharing that with just individuals. I mean, I truly believe in I care. So I take care of myself. And if I need to recharge my batteries, my energy, I will take that time to do that so that I can be um, of service. I started I care without even recognizing I did probably 30 years ago with my grandfather um, who was a very proud man who never went to the doctor but he ended up with uh, bone cancer and what I did was I moved my children in with him and myself and I was the care person for him but then also scheduled set up a schedule so that when I needed a break my aunts and my uncles would come in and care for him. The best experience was asking him, tell me about your life. And at first, he didn't want to do it. And then he started sharing. And we did research. At the time, they didn't have um, Ancestry.com. I was able to go to the Mormon temple and go on, they had a whole history library, microfiche. And so I still have all of that information to date. So I was able to track my grandfather's family back to, I would say 1856. And then because of slavery, that was as far as we were able to go. But out of that, there was a huge sense of love and sharing. Um, he liked, we lived in Northern California and he would love to go to Reno and play the slot machines. Hour and 15 minute drive, I'd give him his medication, we'd get in the van, we'd drive to Reno, he would play the slots for an hour, back in the van and we would come home. And so that's where it came from. And fast forward, um, it's just been incorporated in my nursing practice, but then also volunteering and working with individuals that were transitioning. So from there, it's the nursing became a part of my life. And out of that, recognizing that I could be of service to family members, the community. And I had a very dear friend in Southern California whose husband was transitioning. And I felt honored that when he was in the final stages, that it was me that she came to, to help change his briefs, to reposition him, and that whenever she would have the meltdown, she knew that she could call. I couldn't fix it, but I could listen. And it's very important just to listen. So that was the, the official beginning of, of eye care, from working with individuals that were transitioning and recognizing it's important for everyone to take care of themselves. So that's why it is called I Care. My greatest strength is to be able to have losses in your life and to learn from that and to be able to share, not in the pain or the loss, but to also hopefully share that with someone that has gone through that or is going through it and to be able to say, you know, I truly understand. That's very important. The 
best thing about being a nurse is providing support to that patient and or family member. I believe it's important for caregivers to take care of themselves first is because they have to recognize that their loved one is going to transition and that they have to find tools for themselves so that they are not mentally drained and that they are able to continue with life so that when that person does transition that they're not left with a void. I have taught a course on eye care where I, I show them the importance of tools and we can have all the tools, all the books, we can um, go to all the counselors, but if you do not actually practice, then you will be left with a void. So it's important to find out what they're doing for themselves and to encourage them to take care of themselves. Um, the one recommendation that I truly believe in is get a cat, get a dog, um, have a garden, take a cooking class, um, be with friends. It's a community that's really important to help that caregiver and for them to know that they're not alone. And that as a nurse, I believe it's really important to provide that opportunity for that caregiver to have someone to actually talk to because you want to create a community medical term, a team, but it's really about a community so that that individual knows that they are not alone. I help people as a nurse because I come to it um, wholeheartedly and that it is, it's, it's actually, it's caring, it's, it's being of service. Um, from that, I took a course called Healing Touch and actually I've renamed it to Healing Trust because what it does, in addition to being a nurse, this Healing Trust creates an opportunity to work with someone's energy and to be able to identify if their heart is closed, um, if they have digestive issues, if they have migraines, and it's another tool that I use um, as a nurse. In addition to the medications, it's just talking with them to say, you know, hey, what's going on? I'm here as a nurse, the medical component, but there's depth. There's more than just treating the symptoms. It's being involved and supporting that individual, whatever their wishes are. It's not for me to judge or to change anyone's mind. It's really to help them heal. What words of advice would I share with someone who feels overwhelmed and is a caregiver? You can recognize, oh gosh, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. Let me take some breaths. Let me change my neuroplasticity. Let me come to joy. Let me come to compassion. You bring in compassion, love, joy, an open heart, and that will override feeling overwhelmed. It will still be there, but it won't be as strong. And that's the difference. We have to recognize that we will have our fears, but you bring in the joy, the compassion, the love. What accomplishments am I most proud of? To plant the seeds of joy and love. And you know, it's about the four agreements. Don't make assumptions. Don't take it personally. Always do your best and be accurate with your words. 
those are the things that I think are very important and I would say that's what I live by those are my that's my model for accomplishment I give back to my community by being involved um, I am I feel that I am at home and I am a part of Maui I'm not just someone visiting I'm not just someone that has actually bought some property and I go back and forth. I am grounded. I'm a part of the community. I say aloha to everyone, no matter who they are. And I smile. And that's how I'm a part of this community. Everyone here deserves kindness and respect from the people that are working on the roads to the EMTs, to the people that are working in the grocery store. You give back. I would say my greatest supporters are my children, Adam and Jessica. And even though Megan isn't with me in the physical form, she is with me spiritually. So that's where I find the support and the love. Oh, and my grandson, Wyatt. <laughs> what does success mean to me? Success, it is what's in your heart. It's being able to forgive. It's really about you being able to have integrity. And it's about keeping your heart open no matter what, but also at the same time understanding your boundaries and giving other people boundaries so that you can live a life full of integrity and having equanimity, which is a balance. What's important to me is integrity and respect. What am I most grateful for? I am grateful to be able to have a conversation with my aunt who's 85 years old. And it is a conversation about life. And we're able to share our perspectives. We just had a conversation Sunday and it was about Learning to listen. We have to stop doing what we're doing. And we just need to learn to listen. And that is very powerful. I actually have it on a 3 by 5 card that I have saved and sent her a copy of it. Because we are able to share what's taken place that day and what we've learned from each other and to be able to say, I love you, at the end of the conversation. My Supergirl power is to wake up in the morning, to take a breath, to pour myself a cup of coffee, and to have an open heart to say, okay, surely, allow whatever to happen today, happen. And don't take it personally. Don't judge. Stay with an open heart and enjoy life. That's my Supergirl power. I feel beautiful internally. It's not about external beauty. And people will say, oh gosh, you're 65. I can't believe you're 65. And it's not about that. What causes me to feel beautiful is that feeling in my heart that when that's open and when you're able to say, I love you, that's what makes me feel beautiful. This is heart-centered, what I'm doing. And to be able to share it in this venue, this capacity, is a gift.
So thank you.